You're listening to Nutrition Matters Podcast with Paige Smathers, Registered Dietitian Nutritionist. Nutrition Matters Podcast explores how to approach food and your body in a whole new way. I interview people who share stories and expertise in rejecting diet culture, making peace with food, and discovering a more positive, realistic, and sustainable approach to health and well-being. I'm Paige Smathers, Registered Dietitian Nutritionist and owner of Positive Nutrition, an in-person nutrition therapy practice in Salt Lake City, Utah. I offer free resources, including this podcast, a blog, and posts on social media. If you're local to Salt Lake City, check out our services and availability for appointments and keep your eyes out for in-person groups on mindfulness, intuitive eating, body image resilience, and more. Go to positive-nutrition.com and hit subscribe if you'd like to keep in touch. I also offer online courses covering topics like the science of nutrition, mindfulness, and healing your relationship with food. Check those out at positive-nutrition.com slash academy. If you like what you hear on the podcast, you can make a difference by leaving a review, sharing with friends and family, or making a donation. Thank you so much for your support. You can also find me on Instagram or Facebook if you'd like to have a little more food for thought at Paige Smathers RD. Thank you so much for listening. Hi, everyone. It's Paige. Welcome to Nutrition Matters Podcast. As always, I'm so glad you're here. And I loved this conversation I'm about to share with you with Virginia Soul Smith, who is the author of the book, The Eating Instinct, a Food, Culture, Body Image, and Guilt in America. Virginia is a talented writer. Um, she Her work has appeared in the New York Times Magazine, Harper's, Slate, and Elle, She's a contributing editor with Parents Magazine, and she has two daughters, and her one of her daughters is sort of the overarching theme throughout this book, and we talk about her, her name's Violet, we talk about her throughout the podcast episode, and um, this one is just such a good episode for anybody who's interested in women's health, who's interested in understanding kind of the cultural influences in our relationship with food and our bodies. And um, it, I really, really just enjoyed it so much. And I love the perspective of talking with someone who is a journalist uh, rather than a dietitian or a therapist. Not that dietitians and therapists aren't great, but uh, she brings Virginia brings a different type of perspective to these conversations. And I'm so grateful for her voice. I'm grateful for the work she does. We also, in this podcast episode, talk a little bit about menstruation and other elements of women's health. So stay tuned for a really interesting episode. Uh, Really quick, I did not give Virginia the chance to talk about how to get in touch with her. I forgot to do that at the end of our recording. So I did want to mention that in the intro. Uh, You can find her work at virginiasoulsmith.com. I'll always post, I'll also post these in the show notes as well. So if you don't quite Uh, get these written down, or if you can't remember them, just feel free to check out the the show notes. She's also the host of the Comfort Food Podcast. Um, I'll post a link there. If you'd like to follow her work on Instagram and Twitter, she is at V underscore Soul Smith, S-O-L-E-S-M-I-T-H. And then of course, I'll post a link to her book, The Eating Instinct, in the show notes as well. So with that, I just want to mention one quick thing. Um, I'm so excited to be offering a webinar for registered dietitians worth 1.5 continuing education credits on May 21st at 10 a.m. If you can't make it live, that's okay. Anybody who signs up for the webinar will receive um, a link to the live recording as well as the Um, recorded version after the fact, and you'll get a continuing education credit for either of those. Um, I'm going to be teaching kind of the basics of acceptance and commitment therapy, kind of getting you started to understand what the concept is, how it applies to the dietetic setting, and then also providing some more resources for continued learning. So May 21st, 10 a.m., if you're interested in learning more about how to more effectively Um, counsel your clients and patients, I highly recommend uh, checking out this training with me. I'm super excited about this. I've loved diving into the research and I'm so excited to share with you um, what I've learned. So you can head on over to positive-nutrition.com slash webinar if you are listening to this before May 21st. If you're listening to this after May 21st, just go to the Academy 
tab on the Positive Nutrition website, and um, you can sign up to get access to the recorded version there. I think that's about it as far as announcements. Um, so excited you're here as always, and uh, for anybody who is not a professional but who follows the podcast and you're interested in uh, June's webinar, that one will be geared toward the lay public, so keep your eye out for that as well. All right, with that, let's get into my conversation I had with Virginia Soul Smith, all about her new book, The Eating Instinct. And with that, let's get started. Hi, Virginia. Welcome to Nutrition Matters Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Oh, thanks so much. This is so fun. I've really, really enjoyed your book, and I cannot wait to dive in and talk about so many of the amazing themes that you wrote about in, in this book. So uh, before we do that, let's just take a minute and introduce yourself sort of on a surface level, and then we'll dive into you in more depth when we talk about your book. Sure. So I'm Virginia Soul Smith. I am a writer. I'm a contributing editor to Parents Magazine. I'm the co-host of the Comfort Food Podcast, and I'm the author of The Eating Instinct, Food Culture, Body Image, and Guilt in America. And so I've been a journalist for, oh gosh, about um, somewhere north of 15 years, um, primarily writing about women and our bodies and food, um, and increasingly more about uh, girls, like kids and food and our bodies as well. Um, and, you know, I just really focus on how our culture gives us so many complicated messages about all those things and, you know, how we can simplify it for ourselves. Oh, and so that's exactly what this book is about that you've written. Is this your first book? This is my first book. Um, well, the sort of backstory is uh, earlier in my career as a journalist, you know, I was primarily writing for women's magazines, but I had a sort of side gig ghostwriting various celebrity lifestyle books. So I was sort of in the trenches of diet culture, very much on the wrong side for a bit with some of those projects. And I have to leave it at that. But okay. uh, this is the first book I've gotten to put my own name on and really Yay. tell the story I wanted to tell. So, Oh, that must feel so good after yeah, all that it's time. Amazing. It's amazing. So tell us a little bit about kind of like build the context for writing the story. You just did a little bit with the ghost writing backstory, but tell us a little bit about kind of growing up and your childhood and young adulthood with food and kind of early career. And then we'll, we'll dive into the context of the book. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So going all the way back. Um, so, you know, I had a pretty not stressful relationship with food growing up. I'm pretty lucky in that way because I was actually a very picky eater. Um, but my parents were sort of, I think they just, um, they didn't make too much of an issue about it. They were like, okay, she eats turkey sandwiches on white bread with the crust cut off every day for lunch for eight years, but it is what it is. Like they didn't give me a complex about it. Um, you know, they would introduce other foods, but they you know, I didn't experience a ton of pressure around eating, which I was really grateful for. In retrospect, I know that part of that is because I was a skinny kid. And so no one was really worried about my body. You know, I had a lot of thin privilege as a child. Um, of course we didn't call it that back in the eighties, but, uh, but I was, you know, kind of coasting along and I was aware of, you know, weight as being something that other people worried about that, you know, my mom or her friends or my friends at school, especially as I got into high school, I had a lot of girlfriends who were constantly on diets, constantly worrying about their weight. And it always really made me sad. Um, but I didn't necessarily connect to it as an issue for me until I went to college. And when I went to college, I did gain the quote freshman 15 pretty quickly. Um, you know, I was away from home for the first time. I was, you know, I went to college in New York City, which is coming from a small town was a pretty uh, big shift. And, you know, ended up taking a lot of comfort in the dining hall um, with triple decker right. peanut butter sandwiches, which were really delicious. Um, <laughs> but then suddenly finding myself feeling much less comfortable in my body. This isn't the body I've always identified with having. And that did sort of set me off on a path of, you know, never full eating disorder level behavior, but definitely much more anxious about food, anxious about my body, trying to figure out a better way through it and, um, you know, dabbling with different types of dieting. Um, 
And then as a journalist, I started working in women's magazines. My first job out of college was actually at Seventeen magazine. So this was really interesting because at 17, we got letters every single day from young girls saying, you know, I'm so unhappy with my body. You know, my friends are all thinner and prettier than me. And, you know, I, I can't find a prom dress. I like, you know, all the body anxieties that teenage girls have, which are really real and really overwhelming at that age, particularly. And I became aware that there was this disconnect where we sort of took that very seriously. And a couple times a year, we would do a story about bulimia or anorexia um, in this sort of very serious after school special way. But then the rest of the time we were doing, you know, how to get your bikini body or how to get ready for prom in a very diety way. And that disconnect really started to grate on me. I thought, you know, why are we telling these girls they need to make their bodies smaller? Why aren't we saying you're great how you are. Let's look at the culture that tells you that you need to worry about this. Um, but that wasn't, you know, I didn't have that all neatly summed up like that at 22 as a, you know, as someone struggling with my own body stuff yeah. and sort of jumping into this career. But as I went along through my twenties, I feel like I was kind of back and forth where I would, I would start to learn about health at every size. I would find it so empowering. I would be totally in that space. And then I'd have to write an article about portion control or curbing your sugar cravings. And I would kind of fall into that realm for, you know, this feels like the answer. And I think what I was really doing was like constantly looking for this idea of this answer. I knew the dieting wasn't good for women in particular on one level, but on the other level, I didn't know what the alternative was, you know, it's like, well, I guess I just have to find a better diet. I have to find a plan that makes you thin and makes that, you know, makes having your body fit into the world feel easier, but doesn't feel like so, you know, isn't so much deprivation, isn't so hard to live with, you know, surely that unicorn of a diet must exist. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm sure so us, many listeners can relate to that. that yeah. Idea I think a of lot like... of us spend a lot of time looking for that perfect, easy yeah. diet. Um, and then the other shift that happened, so all of this that I've been talking about was in the late 90s and early 2000s. And then by the time you get into kind of the mid aughts, we started to have the rise of the alternative food movement. And so this was when folks like Michael Pollan and Mark Bittman and Eric Schlosser were all writing about the need to eat organic, the need to eat a more plant-based diet, um, switching to, from processed foods to whole foods. And this was a really interesting moment because on the one hand, it felt like a big backlash against sort of capital D diet industry that I had been writing about for all those years. You know, it was like calories don't matter anymore. It just needs to be plant based or, you know, don't eat that light yogurt. It's full of, you know, nasty additives and too artificial sweeteners like you can have real yogurt, you know, and that felt really liberating because it was like, oh, you can actually eat all this food. But what I realized, you know, after a few years in that space was like, oh, wait, well, you can sort of eat all this food, but like you still can't eat the cookie. You still can't eat the gluten. I mean, the dairy, I don't know. Do you know the cow that made it? Like, you know, there was this whole <laughs> yeah. new set of rules that came along. And so that's sort of where I was struggling with that identity when my daughter Violet was born. And so now this is where the story takes a little bit of a left turn, but stay with me. So when Violet was born, she, um, you know, we thought she was perfectly healthy during my pregnancy. And even at birth, she appeared to be perfectly healthy. But when she was a month old, she almost died. She went into massive heart failure. And what we know now is that she was actually born with a rare set of congenital heart defects that caused her heart to shut down very rapidly in the first weeks of her life. And we're incredibly grateful to the doctors who saved her life. You know, it was a harrowing, harrowing experience to go through. But what they couldn't prepare us for in the sort of initial trauma and emergency of all of that was that Violet, while she recovered from the, that and while they were able to stabilize her heart, she completely stopped eating. And it was a response to all the trauma she'd gone through, plus the side effect of being so weak and, you know, dealing with all of um, the medical stuff she was dealing with. And, and that so part in the book, Virginia, like, it grabbed my heart so much. Like oh, the way you described... You. The way you described the feeling of being her mom and having that be your job to feed her, yet you felt I, I, just the feelings you described and explained, I, it was really, really heart wrenching. I can't imagine how difficult that must have been for you and your family. Well, it really is when all of this kind of came to bear because, you know, when you think about what your expectations are for yourself, as a, I mean, 
well, I can speak from directly what my expectations were for myself. And I suspect a lot of people can identify with this. You know, when we think about becoming a mother, one of the first things you think about is how you're going to feed your baby. And right now in our culture, we know that breastfeeding is the best way, quote, best way to feed a baby. That's what we hear over and over and over. And so, of course, we all think, well, okay, you know, that's what I want to do. Um, and, you know, I'd spent this pregnancy again, very much in this sort of clean eating, whole foods, you know, like all the avocado and eggs and whatever else was sort of like, you know, the really popular, healthy prenatal food at the time. Um, so I really felt like I tried so hard to do everything perfectly. I tried to follow all of these rules. And then again, with breastfeeding, I tried so hard to follow all these rules to do it right, to live up to this ideal. And then it just didn't work. And it didn't just kind of not work, like it didn't work. She couldn't eat at all. She was on a feeding tube and it was the only way we could get any nourishment into her was to give her formula through this little plastic tube, which is like the exact opposite. I mean, it couldn't be more sort of mechanical and impersonal versus this like rosy idea of, you know, breastfeeding while eating organic salads or whatever <laughs> I thought I was going to be doing, you know, it was the total opposite. And that's kind of when I realized, okay, I've been looking for these rules my whole life. I've been looking for this plan that's going to make everything make sense. But nobody saw this coming. Nobody was, is an expert in this situation. I'm going to have to like trust her and trust myself, and we're going to have to figure this out. And even when you talked about like how you'd you'd feed your sweet baby in this mechanical way and and struggle with with all of the feelings around that, you you also talked about how. Um, you just kind of would fantasize and wish that she could just enjoy like licking. I don't know if you said this, but I'm I'm just imagining like licking a popsicle or like, you know, totally. yeah. like on a summer day, like just <clears throat> you wanted her to have that pleasurable eating experience so much when in those early phases of, of her being on a tube feed. Well, yeah, because again, you know, when you imagine yourself as a mom, I think a lot of us food is very central to that. And so we have this idea that, you know, I thought about the birthday cakes I wanted to make. Like at the time we had these, we lived in this house with these amazing blackberry bushes in the garden. And I pictured her like every summer, her birthday's in August and that's when the blackberries are ripe. And oh, how amazing that we'll be able to like eat these ripe blackberries and, you know, and to suddenly feel like, oh, all these memories that I was sort of building in advance, like these, yeah. these memories that I wanted to give her, I might not be able to, because that's what food really is. Food is comfort and connection and love. And especially between a parent and a child, it should be those things. And so to have that all taken away, you know, even in those early weeks, I just thought like, how will I bond with her? How will we connect? Like what will be our connection? And it turns out, you know, we have a beautiful connection. It is both about food and about a thousand other things. Yeah. And I needn't have worried, but at the time, you know, it was devastating. It really was. So I have to say, I think the listeners, if they if they don't relate on on like, oh, they didn't have the exact same experience with you, I think we all can relate in the way that sometimes you can't really appreciate something until it's gone or you can't right. really learn what something means to you until you have some kind of out of nowhere experience with it where you realize, wait a minute, food is important. This is what food is. And I only know that because it's been I taken away it. from me. Yeah. And I also think you can't always question a system that you've known all your life and been so close to. You can't always get the perspective to question it without being pushed outside it. You know, I mean, this is mm -hmm. how I was able to suddenly look back at these rules about diet culture and eating and start to really question it because none of them worked in our situation because I was so far outside the normal paradigm of food and our cultural ideals about it that I could start to say like, well, hang on, what really works here and what doesn't? And, you know, that in many ways, I mean, I wouldn't wish this kind of trauma or a feeding tube on anyone, but, you know, I'm also grateful for the experience because I don't know that I would have put it all together without oh. it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes when you're in the middle of an experience like that, you just can't see out of it in that way. You can't see why this could possibly be be good, but it's so mm -hmm. I think it's so great to hear you say, "Wow, I'm I'm actually in the end, and not that it's the end, but at this point, I'm grateful for this experience." Right. I mean, I learned so much from it. And yeah. That's yeah. So, yeah. when okay, when you were deciding to write this book, who did you have in mind as, as your audience and, and who did you hope this would resonate with? Well, the interesting thing about the book is 
on the one hand, it's very, very broad. You know, I mean, I start with Violet's story and I start talking about these pressures on moms and young women. Um, but then I explore these, you know, this whole other range of eating issues that can seem really disconnected from what Violet's story is about. Um, and on the surface, they totally are. But the reason I wanted to tackle it from so many different perspectives is because I think at its core, these stories all have this same issue of people being disconnected from their bodies and, you know, needing to find a way back to feeling good about food and about their bodies. Like that's what's happening over and over and over in all these different ways. So, you know, you could say the book is really for anyone who eats or anyone who's ever worried about eating, you know, at the same time, I write for women. I, you know, my mission here is to help women in particular who are struggling with the pressures of diet culture and especially moms who are struggling both with the pressures they experience with diet culture and the um, the pressures they have on how they're going to feed their kids and how they're going to model healthy eating with their families, like all of that. So, you know, really my audience is always young women and moms, but I think there, you know, I've been really pleased since the books come out. I've had like older men come up to me at events and, you know, people who I wouldn't have expected it to have resonated with who felt really connected to it. And that's been very cool to see. Oh, that's so awesome. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that you have old men saying how much they appreciated the story. Yeah, and that's saying, awesome. you know, I was such a picky eater as a kid and everyone made me feel so bad about it. And, you know, like I wish, like it's, you know, these things when eating goes wrong, it leaves deep, deep, deep scars. So these are people carrying something around for 50 years and suddenly able to articulate it. That's amazing. Yeah, and to not feel so alone. Like, oh, right. This, right. yeah. So the structure of the book kind of is half your own personal experience with with motherhood and with Violet and her story. And then also there's a lot of interviews and sort of like a journalistic approach to this topic. Is, is that how you would describe it or what would you add? Yeah. I mean, it's a, narr it's a work of narrative journalism. So, you know, what I always do is start with people's stories, whether it's my own or, you know, as the book progresses, lots of other people. And then as I start to hear people's stories, I I always have questions, larger questions that then I look to the research and to various, you know, quote, experts to give me larger context and analysis and start to piece it together. Yeah, I loved it. I thought you did such a great job with, um, I mean, it's a different look at nutrition and making peace with food and eating food. I mean, there's lots of great books about that from sort of like a self-help place, mm -hmm. but this book is more, uh, more narrative and story, which I think... I don't know. There's something super special about hearing other people's stories. I think human beings are meant to tell stories. Yeah, I agree. And I think especially when it comes to this, all these questions about food, you know, the problem is the diet industry wants to convince us over and over that we don't know what's best for our bodies, that we can't trust ourselves to eat. And that's why we need to follow their plan. And so one of the most powerful things we can do is reclaim that narrative and say, no, this is my experience with my body. This is my story to tell. This is what I know about myself and food. And I need to own that. And so a lot of what I felt like I could do with the book was give people an opportunity opportunity to tell me their stories. And I think, you know, a lot of people in the book, it's not all happy endings. Um, many people in the book are still actively struggling and, you know, were sharing with me like where they were deep in the struggle. But I think even for them, it was cathartic to be able to say, to just sit with someone and tell the story and look at it in that deep way and have someone saying, yes, this is your story. Yeah. I, I completely agree how Someone just listening and letting you explain what happened and what your story is can be therapeutic and healing in and of itself, for sure. Yeah, yeah, it really can. So what were some of the biggest themes that emerged in your work and in your research, uh, both with stories people told you and also maybe science and the literature? What, are, what were some of the themes that emerged that maybe surprised you or even things that you already knew? But for those listening, kind of what, what can they expect to get out of the book a little bit? Well, you know, what was so fascinating, like I said, was realizing that, okay, Violet stopped eating because she didn't feel safe around food. I mean, she very literally was in a place where the act of bringing any food, whether it was breast or bottle to her mouth was, you know, 
totally fear, you know, was terrifying to her. It enabled, she was gagging and crying and she just physically couldn't do it. But when I started to sort of think about that almost as a metaphor, I realized like how many people don't feel safe around food. And so that was sort of my lens as I started collecting stories was who is struggling to feel safe around food. And it turns out, you know, that manifests in so many different ways. So part of, you know, there's one chapter in the book where I look at older children with intense picky eating and how moms and dads struggle with those kids. And often it's because of a sort of mismatch of expectations. You know, parents think that kids need to eat in a certain way. Diet culture tells parents kids need to eat in a certain way. And then kids have other preferences and needs. And, you know, families end up really mealtimes become so fraught because it's that mismatch is so hard to navigate. And then I looked at, okay, well, what happens in the most extreme cases when those kids grow up? And what happens if you're an adult who's intensely picky? So I looked at avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, which is one of the lesser known eating disorders um, where people really have a very physical um, fear of food. And sometimes it's rooted in a sensory issue or they've had a traumatic experience like what Violet had. And sometimes it's, you know, they've had really brutal experiences around feeding in their childhood, some kind of trauma of too much pressure or something like that, that's made eating feel really unsafe. Um, and then I also wanted to explore, okay, how on earth do you learn to trust yourself with food? And how do you listen to your hunger if you're growing up in a household that doesn't have enough to eat? You know, what does literally being hungry in a food insecure household do to your relationship with food? And how do you sort of feel, you know, so I, I talked to women who grew up that way and then even as adults and they were in a situation where they did have enough food, but they still always had that scarcity mentality, that fear that there wouldn't be enough and how that, you know, that ongoing fear kind of underpinned things. So, I mean, that's just some of the stories in the book. Yeah. <laughs> There's really, really a lot I could keep going, but um, those are some of some things that really surprised me and were fascinating to learn about. Absolutely. I, I love that. That's great. And and what were some of the things that you took personally? So we, we started off our interview talking about uh, kind of your history and how when you were early on in your career, you were kind of knee deep in diet culture, but also experiencing a lot of cognitive dissonance because you were mm -hmm. exploring some of these other arenas. So what what did this book and also your experience with Violet, what did that do for you? personally? It's really changed my relationship with food in pretty profound ways that I think I'm really still just kind of absorbing, to be honest with you. Um, but, you know, so it was a couple of things. I mean, it was writing the book, certainly, and doing this reporting. It was also being a mom myself that whole time. And now I'm now actually a mom of two little girls. I was actually pregnant with my second daughter the entire time I was writing this book, um, which was really interesting because, you know, when I was reporting the chapter on people with these strong food aversions, I was like at the height of my morning sickness. <laughs> You're like, me like, too. Yes, <laughs> I agree with you. None of those foods. Um, so I can only live on Jesus. Uh, so, you know, there was this constant, you know, because so much of the reporting of the book involved sharing meals with people and really, you know, like there was a sort of constant reflecting on my own eating as well throughout it. Um, but I've really gotten to a place, I think maybe because I've seen up close and personal now the damage it can do um, with some of the stories in the book. You know, I'm very mindful of how I talk about food and how I model eating and talk about my body in front of my daughters. You know, I keep it very positive. I never talk negatively about my weight or somebody else's weight. I really try to talk a lot about the importance of body diversity. And, you know, we all come in different shapes and sizes. Isn't that so great? And a cool thing, you know, initially, I'm not going to lie, I was doing a lot of that modeling because I wanted to do it for them. But I didn't necessarily, you know, it wasn't that I was lying, but, you know, I was still struggling internally to like really own that. But the more you kind of force yourself to, you know, like put that out there and keep, you know, keep coming back to like, oh, wait, I don't want to, you know, I, catching yourself before you start food shaming or body shaming, you then stop going there. You know, you just stop because you like after you catch it for a while, you stop it stops being something you want to say. You're like, oh, wait, that's not how I feel. So I do feel like much, much, much more accepting of my body now than I have ever in my life, which is really interesting because, you know, I mentioned I had a lot of thin privilege as a child. I don't have that same thin privilege as an adult. You know, I don't want to appropriate the experiences of people in much bigger bod bodies, but, you know, I'm a 
average American sized woman. <laughs> so I'm not living up to that thin ideal that I was trying so hard to live up to as a kid. It turned out my college body is a lot closer to what my grown up body is. And I now feel really good about that. It's not something I spend a lot of time agonizing over. And I, you know, I think so much of that came from doing this work and having to really actively think through what these messages mean and what I want to communicate. Yeah. I would love to know more about kind of what specifically helped you with that, because that for so many is the crux of so many food struggles and so much of the reason why diets are so alluring. So can you kind of talk a little bit more about what clicked? And I don't mean to act as if your process is done because nobody's done with this stuff, but what, what really helped you shift and, and be able to say what you just said, which is, I'm really happy with my adult body. I'm really I'm feeling okay about it. I'm, you know, I, I'd be really interested to hear kind of what clicked for you. Well, I think some of it is kind of very consciously putting yourself in a space where you're minimizing the negative messages. You know, a great thing about constantly reporting on health at every size people is that I'm, those are the people on my Instagram feed now, you know, those are the people whose podcasts I'm listening to. Like I am, you know, kind of bathing in this message a lot of the time. Um, And that's really, really helpful. You know, that helps you do a lot of hard work when you're kind of constantly having these conversations and thinking about these questions. And then I think visually, it's really important. You know, pretty early on, I realized I needed to stop following people on Instagram who made me feel bad about my body. Like, what purpose does that serve? You know, I mean, like, I can't remember which celebrity it was, but insert any, you know, young female celebrity (laughs) who I enjoy. But I was like, you know what, it doesn't make me feel great to like see her bikini pictures every day. It does make me feel great to see more of these body positive people and uh, make sure that my Instagram feed is like very diverse in the types of bodies that I'm seeing. So I remember that it is normal for bodies to look very different. Um, And so that goes a long way. And I do notice, you know, if I watch a show that's, you know, really reinforcing the thin ideal, even, you know, not directly, but just if that's, you know, who's been cast in a TV show is mostly people fitting that thin ideal, like makes me want to go and watch another episode of Shrill on Hulu, you know, to like offset because it's like, it starts to, I start to see the worry creep back in and I'm like, wait, 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 no, no, that's just one narrative. There are these other narratives. So that's been a big piece. Um, I think also, you know, deciding not to verbalize, like I, one thing I'm so aware of is how much women in particular feel like we need to apologize for our hunger and apologize for our food choices. And, you know, and we feel very anxious, like if we're at a restaurant and we want to get dessert, but nobody else is getting dessert, you know, or if our friend orders a salad, we can't order the cheeseburger, like all those small ways that women, you know, engage with diet culture or meal to meal. And as I became more aware of that and started hearing it as so often with my friends, you know, it just mostly made me feel sad. And so it was easier to be like, oh, I don't want to do that. You know, I don't, I don't want to, why am I apologizing? Like I actually get to be hungry. I get to take up the space I need to take in this world. So I don't have like a specific, I wish I had more specific, like this, (laughs) this tip, this tip worked. Cause I don't think, I don't think that's how it is though. I think for all of us, it's this very individual process of questioning which messages you've really bought into and figuring out how to disengage with them. And, you know, we all have a different set of those. So it's like everyone's process is really different. But for me, it was recognizing that, um, you know, this cert- there were certain limiting beliefs about food and bodies that I had really bought into. There were a lot I'd already let go of. Um, but continuing to recognize when I'm feeling stressed out about my body, okay, what is the belief that is feeding this? What's at the core of this? And can I let that go? That process has been really helpful. Oh, no, that, that is beautiful. And I love, I I love that you didn't say, okay, so step one, do this. You know, that's, that's (laughs) not love your body. (laughs) Right, right. That's not at all how it is. And I love that you're modeling, you know, you still have thoughts that come up and you catch yourself and you say, wait a minute, what is this? What's this belief? Or no, this isn't aligning with like how I want to talk about myself. So I'm just not going to. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there's bumps and mistakes along the way, just like there is for me and everybody listening. But I, I think it's so important for us to model that this, this process and this journey doesn't look like dieting, you know, in terms of it's not the opposite of dieting. It's not like, okay, now you have this new set of rules and this new formula and this new 
path to figuring all this out. It's like, no, this is messy and it's up and down and it's difficult, but it's a process. And it also requires a lot of, I mean, introspection and self-awareness and um, just being, being okay with the process kind of being nonlinear. So I love, I loved your answer. I thought that was great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, totally. It is, it's a messy process. And I think, again, that's what's challenging. Diet culture offers you these sort of easy plans that just follow these rules and it all makes sense. And it is the trickier path to say, no, I'm going to figure out my own rules. I'm going to trust myself here, but, you know, ultimately far more rewarding. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I hope that it's okay to kind of throw you a curveball here, but um, you do some amazing writing. And I just, I saw that the other day you published a, um, an article in, what was it? Uh, I forget what, it was it the Scientific American. No, Scientific American. Okay. Scientific American about periods. Do you want to, yes. can we talk about that a little bit? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay. This is, um, you know, it's so interesting because I feel like to an outsider, this might seem like, well, she took another weird left turn. She was all about diet culture and now she's writing about periods. But to me, again, it always comes back to women, like women in our bodies and how we relate to our bodies. And another huge issue we have in our culture is that women and girls are not taught to really even understand our menstruation and our reproductive health, let alone like feel good and celebratory about it. Um, this is a huge source of shame and stress for a lot, a lot of women. So yeah, Scientific American asked me to do a piece on why scientific research is lagging so much in this area. And it was fascinating. There was so much I didn't know. I didn't know, for example, that humans are among one of very few species on earth who do menstruate, like even chimpanzees, chimpanzees do, but even other like gorillas and, you know, other great apes who were very closely related to in terms of DNA, um, they don't get their periods. Uh, Most other mammals don't get periods. Pretty much the only ones who do are us, chimps, bats, and one type of mice. (laughs) so weird. Um, And so right there, we know that, but we don't have any idea why. And that may sound like sort of just like a quirky, nerdy science question, but it really illustrates what's going on is that nobody has really prioritized this research. And that is crazy because menstruation and reproduction you know, humans could not survive without it. We are, menstruation is essential to human survival. It's essential to human evolution because without menstruation, you don't have ovulation and then you don't have babies. So the whole thing is this really, really, really important process, but because it's something women have only ever done, it's not ever been prioritized. You know, you have to remember with medical research, most medical research was done only on men's bodies until far too, like a hundred years ago, even, even more recently, studies were still mostly being done on men. So this has been a huge, huge gap. And there's been tons of myths. And, you know, there was this idea in science that menstrual blood contained toxic ingredients and that like women who are menstruating, if they made bread, it wouldn't rise as well. Or if they arranged flowers, the flowers would die. I mean, crazy things that scientists at Harvard were studying in the 1950s as if those are like real things. And wow. Yeah, I know. It's mind blowing. So what, so what, what sense do you make of that? Like, I mean, so there's stuff about, you know, how to be in like pretty much every holy text there is, right? Like how women are, what rules there are around. Right. Yes, of course. Yeah. So many rules around. Why? You know, what is that um, about? I think at its core, it's misogyny. I think it's, you know, the female body is so powerful and so amazing and it is terrifying to men and men have been in power throughout history. And so, yeah, put women in menstrual huts when they're menstruating so that you kind of know where they are and you can keep an eye on them and you can know then, I mean, the other thing, the power that women's bodies have is, this is another difference we have with most other mammals. We conceal ovulation, which means our fertile window is not visible as, you know, humans, like, you know, other animals go into estrus when they're fertile. And so the, and the male animal knows that the female is like ready to mate with, and, you know, there's like a whole mating ritual around estrus. Humans are more mysterious. We can steal ovulation. And that means that for men to continue to sort of control women's bodies, we have, they have to control menstruation because it's the only visible sign, you know, they can then figure out like, okay, two weeks from now, she's going to be fertile. So I think a lot of civilizations and a lot of religions have formed, 
these systems of controlling menstruation through these different rules about, yes, what women can do, what they can touch, who they can be around. And it's all at its core a way of controlling women in that society. Oh, that's so fascinating. Yeah. And it's what's wow. really fascinating is you sort of think, well, that's just some archaic thing or that's only happening in these distant places. That's not happening here in modern America. But it is because it's still informing how the scientific research is getting done about our bodies. You know, we still don't understand. We don't really know what it means for women's health for us to be on birth control pills for decades at a time. We don't really know why we don't really understand most menstrual disorders like endometriosis or polycystic ovarian syndrome. There's so many things we don't know about how to treat those conditions or why they happen. And so, again, you know, at the core of all of it is this menstrual taboo. And at the core of that taboo is this need to sort of control and suppress women's bodies. So fascinating. And you also made the point that, um, you know, when you look at funding for research about bodies and sexuality, like there is a huge disparity between like research funded for erectile dysfunction or some mm -hmm. male thing versus, you know, even just understanding periods. <laughs> right. I mean, you know, the sort of argument you can say as to why we aren't studying periods more is like, well, nobody dies from cramps. You know, it's not we need to study cancer. We need to study these really important life threatening health issues. And, you know, I'm all for. Yeah, we need more research on cancer. I'm not fighting you there. But somehow we were able to research erectile dysfunction <laughs> and get all these pills on the market. And we have a lot more information about that. So, I mean, that argument falls apart pretty fast because yeah. clearly we prioritize non life and death issues, just not when they happen to women. There's also, I mean, there's also a large body of scientific research that's that's not about, um, you know, cancer or diabetes, but it's in the realm of health as well. I mean, there's all kinds of like psychological studies that happen that are just, I mean, they're very interesting and they inform really important things, but they're not about life-threatening issues either. So, yeah. Right. right, right. So, no, obviously that's sort of a straw argument, but it's the kind of thing that gets made when... You know, I think, unfortunately, and this is making me sound anti-science, and believe me, I'm not. I mean, I wrote this piece for Scientific American. I really believe in science. Um, but I think when, you know, we kind of over and over want to minimize the importance of women's bodies or the complexity of women's bodies, um, you know, that is unfortunately a big problem. It's not just a big problem in science. It's a big problem throughout our culture. But when you see it informing the science, that's super concerning. And that's something we need to change. Yeah, and and part of that's just who gets who gets uh, in the position to be able to study scientific concepts. I think probably overwhelmingly it, it has been men throughout the last many decades, and maybe more yeah, women sure. are getting into that. But also, that's probably another big reason why there's why would a man study menstruation when he could study erectile dysfunction, right? <laughs> <laughs> Except that, you know, again, without understanding menstruation, we don't really understand how humans exist. You know? yeah. I mean, it's so fundamental. True. It informs like every man came from someone who menstruated. Yeah. So yes. uh, it's pretty important. But no, but I mean, you know, what I'm encouraged by is the fact that a magazine like Scientific American devoted an entire issue to this topic. I mean, they have a female editor in chief and a lot of amazing women on their staff now. But that that magazine has been around for a very long time, it has not always paid the closest attention to women's health. So to see them saying, wait, we can fix that. Like, let's do this. Let's really dive in. Let's tackle this, you know, do all these articles on this. Like that, that really gives me a lot of hope that we're heading in a better direction. What were some of the other, other pieces in that uh, issue? There's an incredible piece uh, by Maya Dusenberry about IUDs that I think is a really, really valuable read. Um, and again, sort of the science gaps around what we know about IUDs and long-term use. Um, there's a really powerful piece by Monica McLemore, who is a nurse and reproductive justice activist in California, I want to say San Francisco, she did a piece on maternal mortality and showing the racial disparities in maternal mortality in the United States. Black women are far more likely to die in childbirth than women of any other race. And there's all these, you know, it's just full of really compelling data to break down why that's happening and what we need to be doing about it, what we're not doing about it. Um, and then there's another really terrific piece on freezing your eggs. So something for everyone with a uterus. <laughs> um. <laughs> so fascinating. And again, like, so yeah, people might feel like we've switched topics here and, and in a way we have, but I think this is really true to your work and your mission, which is uh, to help women 
learn more about their bodies and appreciate their bodies and understand them better and to connect with them more effectively and more positively, right? Or what else would you add? No, I think that's absolutely it. I think, you know, what I'm trying to always do is figure out how women can kind of take back all the narratives about our bodies, take back all, you know, reclaim our bodies and our knowledge of our bodies and, you know, or in many cases, gain the knowledge that we've been denied um, and, you know, just really learn to trust ourselves. And I think it's, yeah, it happens around food. It happens around sex. It happens around reproduction. I mean, there's just all these different issues, but this is, you know, this is how we make progress. This is how we figure out how to make a better world for our daughters so that they can, you know, they can take more for granted that they understand their bodies. And, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, as my girls get into puberty and all of that, we can, you know, I can do a much better job. I mean, my mom really did a great job in many ways. I'm not, it's not a criticism of my mom, but um, in terms of talking about bodies, but, you know, I'm hoping that for this next generation, we can Culturally. just make things even better. Yeah, for sure. So in the beginning, Virginia, you talked about how you were kind of looking for the next right thing. And yes, diets have failed, but that's just because you hadn't find the, found the right one kind of idea. Um, and as we've been talking, it sounds like, obviously, your your mind has kind of shifted from that way of seeing it to more of, okay, let's start looking at the messaging in the culture rather than mm-hmm. find, trying to find some magical way to cure X, Y, and Z about something I don't like about my body. So um Is there anything else you'd add that you you wish your daughters or just people in general knew about our culture and its problematic messaging about bodies and food after all the work you've done with your amazing book? Well, I think the other piece we didn't we sort of touched upon, but is worth saying is, you know, there's so much emphasis in our culture on um, on assuming that nutrition is a, this sort of knowable, finite thing, that there's like this exact right way to do nutrition. Um, and also that you should prioritize nutrition at every meal above all else. Like even if you don't enjoy the meal or even if, you know, like you should skip a meal if it's not perfectly nutritious. Like, you know, we really sort of idealize nutrition in this or idolize, sorry, idolize nutrition. Um, and much like the re- research on menstruation, the scientific research on nutrition is very, very far from cut and dried. I mean, you know, we all know that the sort of thinking about what the good food or bad food of the day is like changes almost week to week, it seems like, but certainly decade to decade um, in terms of which macronutrient we've decided is the root of all evil. And so I think it's important to know that like nutrition is useful and nutrition is very, is a valuable tool, but it does not need to define every meal. It does not need to take priority over comfort and pleasure. And, you know, in fact, if you're trusting your body and eating more instinctively, you're going to kind of sort the nutrition piece out just, you know, without having to focus on it so much. I think that's been really liberating for me to learn. And I think that's something that people still struggle because they think like, you know, a question I get at almost every event is like, okay, this totally makes sense. I want to listen to my body, but like not about sugar, right? Like, yeah, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, no, no, no. Even about sugar, you can do it. <laughs> so that's, I think another piece that we have to understand that that's another area where science is still working things out where we need better research. And in the meantime, your body is your best guide. Yeah. And, you know, as someone who has studied nutrition and who this is my career and my job and something that really excites me and I'm super nerdy about, like all of that, yet I completely 100% agree with everything you've said. Like our bodies are wise. Our bodies are worthy of us tuning in and paying attention to them. And I think they have a lot more to offer to us than we give them credit for. And Mm -hmm. no scientific research should trump your own personal lived experience in terms of if you notice, you know what? Um, Yeah, I really enjoy eating a cookie. And I I don't really care if the the quote science says that that's the worst thing ever, But which by the way, it does not say that. And anyone who... (laughs) You know, anyone who makes super cut and dry black and white claims probably isn't really looking at the science. Right. But if, if you know, your Instagram influencer is saying that and you're having tons of guilt and shame and feeling super uh, bad about eating this yummy food that you enjoy, that guilt, that stress, 
that whole physiological response in your body is a whole lot worse for you than right. merely the macronutrients or the micronutrients or whatever nutrition quality of that cookie. So we have to keep that in mind as well. So when we're even when we're looking at nutrition science, we have to keep in mind we're not just a eating robot. We're also we have right. a brain, we have so much, like we're a whole human being with lots of different needs. And so if we sometimes even if we get too into the nutrition uh realm of things, we're forgetting that we're whole human beings with other needs as well. Absolutely. So so true. Well, thank you for your amazing book. I think that this book would be really awesome for, like you said, anybody who eats <laughs> and then also anybody who just wants sort of a a broad look at lots of different ways of why I loved what you said about how your daughter's experience of struggling to feel safe around food kind of served as a metaphor throughout mm -hmm. all of the narratives that you collected. Um, if you've ever felt that way, which I would guess is most people, there's most of us have struggled to feel safe with food in our lives. I just think it, it's a really, really great look at so many different elements of how that can play out for a person and also how you can just not feel so alone in your struggle. I, I really loved what you've done here. So great job. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This has been a great conversation. Thank you. Well, I sincerely hope you've enjoyed this conversation. If you haven't already, please go ahead and leave a review on iTunes. Thanks again so much for listening, and we'll see you soon for another episode.